So I feel like I've been traveling all my life, basically, moving. Um, and, you know, we, I've traveled as a student, I've traveled as a professor, I've traveled as, a, as an architect. And uh, while what we do in, in the professional world is professional, I find travel very personal uh, in terms of my own kind of way in which I try to experience uh, the world as it's given to us. So um, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I'm just in so many ways a liaison between the academy and the, and the profession. That's sort of how I see myself. So this is a kind of strange environment. I had to write some things down. So I'm going to read and ad lib and do all kinds of things here but, uh, and hopefully move this along. So uh, I've broken into three parts really quickly. And one is called Worlds Within Worlds. And experiencing uh, the, let's see if this works, yeah, experiencing the process of the contamination of cultures, whether in the Eastern or Western Hemisphere, or even in seemingly forgotten places in the United States, provides me with a heightened awareness of being between worlds within worlds. These places and conditions are often filtered and translated through the act of design in my work. Brief immersions into living cultures as wide-ranging as the Arkansas Ozarks or the Dogon people of Mali provide an exchange of cultural perspectives and act as a deep source of possibilities in the conception of things and spaces that are understood and felt as somehow strangely familiar. In my, excursion into the, my, in my excursions into the unfamiliar, I'm seeking shared values and conditions of expressive character that may overlap, mix, contaminate my own understanding of things back home and abroad. In my travels over the years as a student, educator, and architect, I've sought out living cultures in places like Mali, Yemen, Quechua, Peru, or in urban megalopolises like Mexico City, Tokyo, or Kuala Lumpur, and those places found on the Grand Tour, like Rome. Uh, I'm in effect seeking difference in developing a respect for difference while engaging the question, how do we embrace the world without being consumed by it? We are shaped, I believe, by our experiences, and this contributes in distinctive ways over time to the expressive character of what we make. As well, it helps sustain our capacity for building well in an often indifferent world. I'm reminded of the story of the artist Robert Irwin when he went to the island of Biza in the early 60s for a week, but wound up staying for eight months, never talking to anyone, just engaged in his own thoughts and the experience of being on this island. After months, he ran out of things to think about, and so he started thinking about thinking. He was greatly moved by all of this, and upon his return to his home in LA, he expected an immediate and productive consequence in his paintings, but nothing happened. Nearly 10 years later, as he was shifting from being a painter to being an artist that constructs perceptual and experiential environments beyond the conventions of the studio, he reflects on this Ibiza trip and finds insight into his own trajectory, why and how he understands. His transformation has been gradual, slow, guided by questions arising from the experience of worlds within worlds. In a similar way, my own evolution as an architect at heart has been deeply directed by my studies and travels abroad over the years, reconnaissance missions into both the past and presence that refine and generate uh, my sensibilities for the future. And so across different timelines, wherever I am in a place, wherever I've been years before, or wherever I am, uh, abroad currently uh, have a, an immediate and often uh, and sometimes delayed effect on how I think about the work and how it manifests itself here, a seven-story house that was informed both by uh, Northwest Arkansas, but my uh, time as a graduate student in uh, Florence, uh, visiting Luca, and time in Yemen. And all of this, again, contaminates and mixes uh, to have uh, influence on the work. Uh, and documenting that work in, in real time Drawing is what I'm saying, not just taking photos, but drawing also has an effect too. To translate uh, what I'm seeing and feeling uh, into something that uh, may have use later on, and that becomes a record uh, of that experience, and again has often very direct effects uh, on the work that I might be currently working on or later working on in the office. Uh, and a project here in 2008 uh, started to suggest to me uh, a shift uh, and how I started thinking about uh, architecture and thinking about space. This is in, uh, uh, 
in Indianapolis, in, uh, a uh, uh, museum, uh, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, Art and Nature Park, an experiential center we were working on at the time. And it was manifesting itself, and I only discovered later uh, uh, that much of this was being generated through drawings in real time as I was experiencing uh, the effects of light, the effects of mass and volume, uh, the effects uh, of space that had a distinct interiority that I hadn't come into contact with before uh, in where I usually work. Uh, this is a place of mud and dirt here in Mali, and, and while we may have volume, we seldom have mass in the way that we work in the States. Uh, at least it's uh, uh, developed through primarily layers rather than actually uh, weight. And so, anyways, we're beginning to think about how uh, light works. And that uh, has begun to kind of inform a lot of what we're trying to do now uh, in our own way. And so it taking me back uh, to Rome, back uh, to places where I, you understand the space of architecture uh, uh, as a container, and it gives form to light. Uh, much of contemporary architecture, uh, the current discourse, and much of what constitutes a contemporary language is mostly defined by nearly seamless relationships between interior and exterior, an evenly lit interior structural expression with exterior articulation as either a glass box or a translucent uh, screen or something. I call it screens and things. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the architecture of the thin, the fast, and the explicit. In the words of James Terrell, he always says, there's too much light. And I've begun to think about that as well. And I've begun to identify this more as something called tonal space, space defined with more shadow than light, which provides a challenge to overtly uh, transparent space. Think Mies. Uh, and the challenge to that is a thick, slow, and implicit architecture that serves a, a variable and continuous dialogue between light and dark to describe a more complex space as suited to the use and desire of experience. Tonal space acts to unite the traditional and the modern through an emotive and sensuous interiority, presenting us with familiar yet new images, real ones, and ones in our mind that may interrupt the habitual way in which we see and feel the world around us. This is space with a tactile luminous that speaks of the sacred and reflective aspects of experience as a poetic endeavor, slowly revealing its figural conditions and densely embedded qualities. It invites the viewer to linger, to experience the time-dependent atmospherics and ambiences of architecture for not only honorific spaces, but hopefully for those that are also prosaic. Through the scatterings of light and dark in space, the ordinary may truly become extraordinary enriching our experience of the everyday world. It's a non-cohesive experience uh, that travel often uh, begets, and it's often uh, a non-cohesive non effect on our work. And I'm showing you work from Rome, from Japan, from Detroit, from a variety of places that share uh, in this kind of tonality uh, of space. And again, there is an analogous relationship increasingly I'm discovering in the way in which we're thinking about work, the ideas of refuge uh, and prospect in the work, uh, the ideas of the texture and pattern and the way in which that works uh, with light in the certain of the things that uh, we're doing. Um, and just uh, thinking about the apparition almost that exists where light comes in and how that too can take something that's relatively sacred, even developed for a sacred program, and how that becomes injected into a more prosaic condition that enriches uh, the day-to-day -day experience that we might have with, you know, very modest work, this being a, a $108 square foot library in Gentry, Arkansas. And simple things that are unexpected in programs like a golf clubhouse uh, that, again, uh, deal with the, uh, the enriching effects of light. Or, and again, something rather prosaic, a doctor's clinic, and how to just use light in a simple way uh, to uh, create wonder, as uh, in this case a pediatric clinic, as children come up the stairs into the reception area, uh, using light in a very kind of direct, immaterial, yet tangible way 
uh, to uh, enrich the spaces in which it happens and create a, a little bit of dignity uh, in those spaces as well. Uh, again, thinking about how we enrich the everyday, a school in Dallas here uh, that deals not so much with making, a, again, a, a glass vitrine uh, for uh, things to take place, but been controlled uh, light and very specific types of interiority uh, for learning in. And thinking about our own ideas about thickness uh, and implicitness in the work as we develop it uh, at various scales uh, throughout. Uh, the architecture school, again, trying to work back and forth between the liminal zones at the edge and these more uh, uh, kind of dramatic spaces uh, on the interior. And always with the mind that uh, light in this way usually works best from above and with some color. I think a lot of this came uh, to fruition in a little church uh, that was a welding shed, that was once a welding shed, and was at, transformed into a church And for $100 a square foot. All we had for, going for us was light, light and color. And reminded of the experiences in my travels on the Grand Tour uh, and how that could bring something so modest to life uh, that uh, has, has been uh, you know, a quite significant impact in the community that it's in. Just uh, very controlled ways of bringing light in. This is a, a, a dome that's actually made out of a side light dish. I mean, repurposing, but again, thinking about uh, how the sacred can become part of the secular and the secular can become part of the sacred. So really contaminating both. I'll end with this. A simple story. Um, I was at a candlelight vigil. I go to my mom's church once a year, usually Christmas Eve. Uh, and it's a candlelight church service on Christmas Eve. Uh, darkness, points of light, illuminate yet mostly obscure our physical differences, our social and political variety, uniting us ever so briefly as one in the spirit of God and humanity. I'm reminded of my recent trip to Andalusia in Spain. I'm with my family in the ancient city of Cordoba, where we were having dinner in the old Jewish quarter at a Sephardic restaurant, only a block away from the great mosque with its Byzantine uh, Christian chapel buried deep within. Near our table in the courtyard, there is a quartet playing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah in the moonlight. The surreal mixes with the real. In a time when we seem more divided than united, I am reminded of a period in the Middle Ages when the city was shared in harmony by the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews, free to live in their traditions and compassion for all. The darkness within the great mosque church and the heavenly light above unite all who visit as one people without prejudice. Human presence is real, revealed by the light behind every shadow. The chiaroscuro of darkness through its emotive atmosphere that affects us deeply is a great equalizer of the physical, social, and political conditions of humankind. In the drama of spaces where there is more darkness than light, the graduated absence of light in spaces both sacred and secular, we celebrate the unifying power of darkness and the tactile mystery of light. Thank you. Thank you.